We cannot make it on our own, oh God. We need the cross and our Savior's blood. We cannot make it on our own, oh God. We need the cross and our Savior's blood. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down our idols so give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another won't you give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face. Oh, God, of Jacob. Yes, God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face. Oh, God of Jacob, we cannot make it. We cannot make it on our own. Oh, God, we need the cross and our Savior's blood. We cannot make it on our own. Oh, God, we need the cross. And our Savior's blood. So give us clean hands. And give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. We pray. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face. Oh God, his face alone. Yes, God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face. Oh, God of Jacob. Amen, Lord, let that be the cry of our hearts, that we would seek you and you alone. Lord, when we put down our idols, let it be because we realize they don't work for us. Lord, they don't bring us the life that they promised. They don't bring us the life that we were made to have and made to live. And so, Lord, we put them down, we cast them down, and let us seek your face. And your face alone, God. Let us see your face and your glory as we open your word together as your church. And God, let your spirit be at work here among us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you for Craig and the worship team. You know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, they just think everything comes up and everything's great on Sunday morning. But the amount of time that so many of our instrumentalists and our vocalists and and I know we don't have a, a traditional choir on a regular Sunday, but there is a pool of singers in our church. And you'll notice you don't see the same faces up here every week. Uh, Craig has done an amazing job, in case you don't know, of, of rotating people and getting new people involved. So every once in a while you'll see a fresh face, a new face up here that helps lead worship. Uh, you see our college students. Um, I, I've done that job. I know what, it, what it's like uh, just a year ago. And so some of our college students during the summer go home, and some of our graduates that have graduated from our church that went away to school come home, and you have to switch, and you have to schedule all those people. Um, it is a little bit different, and not, not downgrading or saying anything. It's just different. Uh, used to, you'd show up, and I, I led worship uh, many years, and you'd show up, and you'd have a piano player every week. And they were always there. 
and, and you'd, you'd give them music, and they, they learned it, and, and you'd show up, and you'd have a piano player, and you'd lead, piano player, and lead. And the big thing that's changed, and what you, a lot of people don't know, is there's a lot more people involved in different aspects of worship ministry today than, than there was 20 years ago. And it's just different. Um, we didn't worry so much about, we, you realize we have three people doing media in our church right now. Actually, no, four. Four. Now, used to, we used to call sound systems, set, them, set it and forget it. Which meant you flipped a switch and you walked away and the microphone worked, the piano worked, and that was it. And you picked up a hymnal. That is not the case anymore, and it's not saying good or bad. It's just different, okay? We have somebody running a camera right now to, to control the stream, and also with a set of headphones in, running the sound for that stream. We have a host sitting online right now making sure that when people log in, they're greeted. You know, one of the things that when we streamed, when we shut down and, and, and couldn't open, is we wanted to make sure that when you got on our stream, you weren't we wanted to make sure there was connection. So we made sure there was always a host every week. There's somebody on there saying, hey, we're glad that you're here. And saying things like, hey, the question that the pastor just asked, what do you think about it? Getting a response, pulling, interacting. We have somebody that's running these slides right now, making sure that they're, the words are they're on. We have somebody running the sound. Now, like I said, it used to be set it and forget it because you had a piano, you had a, a person, you had a pulpit mic, and that was it. Now, I'm wearing a microphone, there's a monitor right there, there's a mic there that's not on right now, but it was just a second ago, and they're having to control things. So there is a lot more that goes into Sunday morning leading worship, and I'm not saying there, there's more or less than it used to be, it's just different. And so I appreciate and maybe you, you may not understand this, but I do when I come every week and I see there are so many things. To stand up here and lead music and just you're not just concentrating on what's on that page because Craig is, he knows if that sound system goes up, no one ever notices the person up there unless there's a problem. But ultimately it goes to him and he has comes up and he's like, all right, we had these problems this week. Now I got to fix them this week when no one's in here and there's no band and he's required, he, it's his responsibility to take care of that. So when they come up here and they do just a great job of leading worship, just I, I encourage you to thank them, to, to say thank you to them uh, for all the time, not only Craig does, but all of our instrumentalists and our singers, and it's, it's a great opportunity, and a lot of churches don't have the depth that we do musically, and you may just see five people up here, but the pool that come up every week all the time, we are, we are, we are blessed as a church musically have this many instrumentalists to play different instruments and lead us in worship. It is not something that every church has. So I appreciate that. I know I kind of went off on a tangent there, but but I, I understand it and I see it and a lot of people don't. And I want you to just be aware of how amazing it is uh, for a manual family to have that. So so this week, here's what happened is, is uh, Pastor Clint uh, messages me on Thursday and he says, hey, be prepared. I'm, I, I kind of not feeling well last night, and uh, so you might need to preach Sunday, and I'm like, okay, that's fine, whatever needs to happen, you get feeling better, okay, and th he left it at that, and then Friday comes around, and I'm at the office, and my whole thing is, we're kind of wondering, how are you okay, is, is something going on, and you know, most of the rest of the week, because we were all sick, and things like that, and then s Friday afternoon, Craig decides to send a group text that said, so what's Sunday's plan? Who's preaching? Or how's everybody feeling? And so Friday afternoon, in this group text, I get we get an answer. Hey, Roger's preaching. We're gonna do this. And my first response is, Oh, I am. Okay. And so I'm like, All right. So here we go. So we're in the middle of a of a series as as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. Well, here's the problem. I'm sure Pastor Clint has already sat down with this message for this week in his order, and he just kind of said, I hope you have her prepared, and I'm like, okay, so I'm not really fitting into Sermon on the Mount, but I get a one-week sermon, and sometimes that's more, more difficult, by the way, because you're like, okay, I want something that like people will remember, and it's just not, oh, that's, I don't want to be the substitute teacher-preacher, okay? 
You, you don't always, you only remember the bad substitutes. Let's be honest. We had one in, in, the, in high school and, and middle school. Her name was Miss Helen. And we remember Miss Helen because she was, she was what we call also a, a screamer, which meant you could hear her down the hall when she got upset. And so we always remember those. And I don't want to be that on a Sunday morning. And it, so it's really nice when, Craig, when, when Clint uh, asks me to preach and then tells me, hey, you're going to fit into this message. Here's where the sermon series going. That's, that's nice. This was not one of those. So I had to sit down and be like, all right, God, what, what, what do you want to teach? What's going on? And so I'm going to kind of bridge the gap between two, a little bit on the Sermon on the Mount and a little bit about what's going on on Sunday nights with this new prayer study that we're going through. So we're going to talk about prayer today. And I got a little frustrated at myself because as I began to look and I began to be like, what have I preached on on prayer before? How have I preached on it? And I started looking back at, at messages for our youth and our young adults and messages I've, I've preached before. And I realized that though we talk about prayer a lot, one of the things I think I've missed, and maybe it was because I'm kind of looking at that with my own kids, is that one of the things being, hey, how do you pray? And I was drawn first to, to Matthew 6, and we're going to look at this in two parts, like, uh, like I said, Matthew chapter 6, because I feel like this first part really needs to be important to jump to the second part, okay? So Matthew chapter 6, talking about how to pray, because as if I have kids and we sit there and I think we expect them to know how to pray. I mean, you've all sat there before in, in, in Sunday school, in, in Bible studies, just at home, I'm, I'm the designated prayer at every family gathering I have because I'm on staff. So there's never any question about who's going to pray. The pastor prays. Okay. I'm like the professional Christian. I'm paid to be a Christian. And so we get that. And, but have you ever been to that awkward situation where you're like, okay, who, who wants to pray? And nobody says. We, we do this in our family. We, we, we have... We pray before bed every night, and we sit there, and, and we sit there with our kids, and me and Lisa will decide who's praying, or, or one of us will pray, and every so often we'll be like, okay, does anybody else want to pray? And they just, everybody looks down, by the way. Don't make eye contact. And I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about what are messages where we actually teach people to pray? Where are those messages? Now, I found a whole lot of sermons and a whole lot of things out there that talk about why we should pray. How do I have an effective prayer life? But I started thinking, if you're a brand new believer, how do you pray? The disciples had that same question, right? They went to right to the source, so let's begin to this. So you remember that the, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Master, teach us how to pray. So before we jump into anything else and pray, well, I want to talk about this. And, and this is just a sample. Here's the thing about prayer, and I'm going to tell you. And I heard this analogy, and I, I thought, man, prayer is something you, pro you learn more in a laboratory than in a classroom. As you walk in your walk with Christ, you're going to learn it more in the lab than you do in the classroom. You're going to learn more about prayer by doing it and experimenting it and doing than you are somebody standing up here teaching, but I believe that every laboratory needs to start in the classroom. Okay? We don't want, I don't know, maybe your kids did this, or maybe your kids do this. Do they ever experiment? They go in the kitchen, and they sit down at the table, and they make some random concoction. Okay, okay. So, some parents just got these mental images, because what comes with experiment is the mess, Right? Or you take them out to eat and you let them get a soda, you let them get a pop, only it's the old, you know, maybe pre, post COVID you don't have this, or now they have the machines where you have to pick. No, 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 let's go the old school McDonald's line. And they decide, I know what I want. We always called this a suicide. And so they start on one end and they go, chick, 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 chick. just a little bit of every soda they can come up with. Okay, so that's an, that's an experiment. Now, here's the thing about that is when we experiment in prayer, we probably don't want 
believers starting that way. We need somebody. That's what discipleship is. We come alongside you. We're going to do it. But then we're actually going to put it into practice. So Jesus begins like this. and Because he tells this, and we call this the Lord's Prayer. You can also call it a sample prayer. Because of what Jesus says. You know, he also says, he's going to begin to by saying, pray like this. So how can we break this up? And this is just kind of a, a beginning classroom segment on how to pray And how do we do this before we jump into more? So Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5, says this. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Big verse 9, here we go. And then pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So beginning this classroom session of training on how to pray, again, Jesus says, pray like this. I want to break it up into four sections of ways to pray and make sure that when you sit down that you're praying this. Is it wrong to pray this prayer? No, not at all. It's a great thing. It's words of Jesus. It's a great thing to pray. But what are elements that Jesus had in his prayer that when we sit down to pray, we can make sure that we're a part of that and we're praying like Jesus did. Well, the first beginning in verse 9, as he began to this, he started this by praising God. By praising God. He came first in verse 9 and said this. He said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is in his heaven. He he prays on God. He told God how magnificent he was. He gave him thanks. Thank you for all you're given. I always liken this, and, and, and you, you got to take this part with a grain of salt, okay? With a little bit. Here's, here's why, okay? I always liken this to when your kids come up to you and want something. What do they first do? Hey, Dad, you know I love you. Hey, Dad, I really like your, your shoes today. Man, that shirt looks good on you, Dad. Hey, Mom, man, you look really pretty today. And when it's out of, out of, if it's out of norm, if it's not their normal, out, as a parent, your first click in your mind is, okay, what do you want? And so I'm thinking, this isn't a bad thing. And, and we need to be careful about why we praise God, don't we? So it doesn't become that. Do you, you notice that almost every one of our worship services, what we usually start with? Somebody's like, music. Yes, music. But we have times of praise. We praise God. Our songs that we sing, our songs of praise to God, who he is, what he means to us. And when we sit down to pray, to thank God for who he is. Not for anything that we bring to the table for he, who he is. And then he continues in verse 11 as we go through this. And he begins to this uh, in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Here's what he comes in. Part number two after we praise God is we begin by repenting. We begin by saying we're sorry. We begin by looking inward and saying, where have I messed up? We break that. So praise, repentance, 
we ask him forgiveness. See, this all being before, because the third step's the one we're really good at, right? It's the Christmas list, right? When, when A lot of times when we actually pray, it's this last one. So we've praised God, we've repented, and then we come to a request or we ask God. Where we ask him. Now here's the thing, sometimes we miss one and two because our prayer is just that. It's, it's a giant request. It's a giant Christmas list. God, what I really want is this. What you need to do for me is this. Is it wrong to ask God for things? No, not at all. He wants us to do it. It says in his scripture that he wants us to present our requests before God. But how we do that and why we do that are always examined by God. Is it wrong to ask? No, but in what way are we asking? So ways to pray, to praise him, to, re- to, to repent, to ask. And then last one, this is the one we don't like, is yield. Yield. This is also called <laughs> waiting. And we don't like that. We're going to get to that a little bit more. But yielding to God, because the answer to God, I'm going to probably date myself here. There was a, um, a song many years ago. I don't want to say many years ago, but I have to. Garth Brooks wrote a song. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Well, that's a great song, and it's a great fun thing. If you want to dig it up in the oldie station, man, I hate saying that. Wow. But the truth is, it's not biblical. Can I tell you why? No is an answer. No is an answer. It's not the answer my kids want. It's not the answer I want. If I request something, you don't want to hear no. But it is an answer. And sometimes yielding and waiting on God for him to tell you no is not what we want. So as we begin to pray... How to pray, again, this is the classroom session of why we look at that. Now, the second part is this, and this is where I said I'm going to kind of bridge the gap. Because I'm going to look at, first we looked at the how-to, now we're going to be look at reasons we don't. And here's what the thing is, 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 is with, 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 with our lives, why don't we pray more? Why don't we pray more? Trying to, trying to think of, of a good way and a good way to, to kind of have with God in, in why we don't pray and things that we happen in our lives to mess that up. And I don't know about you, but one of the questions that I get asked everywhere we go, maybe you walked into this building, and maybe it's not just, it's just not a generational thing anymore. It used to be. But I got this question from the youth and from my kids and from my mother-in-law when she lived with us. Here's the question. As you walk into a new place, a new building, the new church, upstairs, a new, a new student walks in, and you want to know what the first question they ask? Hey, what's the Wi-Fi password? Now, now think about your connection with God, because when we go to pray, what the big thing is is that connection. Why do we pray? Because it connects us with God. So the big question is, when it comes to your walk with Christ, when it comes to your connection with God, hey, God, what's the Wi-Fi password? How do you connect with God? And when you're not, what's messing up that connection? What's messing up that connection with God? I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel limited in certain aspects in my own prayer life and things like that, or I come. And sometimes we pray and we have this connection problem because we really think, God, when I pray, I don't even know if it's getting out of the room. And some of us come to the point where we're, we've prayed for so long that we're about to give up. And we know how to pray and we reach prayer and we're like, am I doing it right? Because I feel like I'm just praying over and over and over again and nothing is happening. Sometimes we get to the low point in our lives and we just want to be like, I I don't have anything left. We're 
going to open up into, into Luke chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, a real passage here. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to look at, at, at a connection between God and an individual and things that, that, that they allowed um, to become disruption between their connection between them and God. So Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, And in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, and of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments and statues of God. Wouldn't you love that to be what was said about you in the word of God? Verse 7. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty according to the customs of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside of an hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to the disobedient and the wise and of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Husbands, don't ever say that. Just, just saying. Not, not, not good here. Not good here. Just saying. And the angel, verse 19, And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remaining mute. And when this time of service had ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and at five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done to me in the days when he looked at me to take away my reproach among people. Let me pray as we begin. Father, just thank you for this time that we could come and worship you, that we would praise you, God. But God, so many times when we come and we pray, we feel maybe there's a disconnect. And we want to look and examine ourselves today using your word as an example as you examine us and say, God, why do we lose connection with you? What messes up that disruption? What disconnects us from our relationship with you so that we can correct it, so we can strengthen it, so we can learn from it, and so we can teach it to other believers? In your name we pray. Amen. So, we have this end of the story, and many of you guys have read this story and know this story. This is the, the, the birth of John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, and, and we have this guy, his dad, named Zechariah. We have a woman named Elizabeth, and she couldn't have kids for a really, really long time until finally Elizabeth gets pregnant, and she has a boy, and his name's John, Okay. So if we simplify and break down this verse, or break down this time, well, this is what we find. Now here's the thing, is we can find some disconnects or some things that may cause us to not connect with God in this story. There are reasons that this story should have 
went differently. And whether John and, or excuse me, unless Zechariah and Elizabeth may have had part in some of these, we definitely have part and reasons that we quit connecting with God as an example of what they were going through. So five things, five disconnects that may cause us to disconnect with God in our walk with Christ. Okay, first of all is Luke 1, verse 5 through 7. We see this. We disconnect with God because of our circumstances. Zechariah and Elizabeth had a lot of circumstances going on in their lives on why they might disconnect with God. Okay, here's what. First of all, think about what Zechariah does. He's a priest. Okay, so what happens is, is once a year, they, they, would, they would go, or, or certain times of the year, they would go into the Holy of Holies, they would go and offer sacrifices at certain times, and there were the different groups of priests that would come in, and they would kind of rotate them around, and who did that service, who did that incense. So not only that, is, is the, the, the priest group that is supposed to offer this sacrifice is Zacharias at that time. So they all go to the temple, and then they draw lots in who actually gets to go into that place where God is and offer sacrifice. Now, this isn't just like draw straws, okay, you're the one, see you later. No, because there was preparation. Okay, you had to be forgiven, you had to be holy, you had to be as pure as you could be to enter into that place to be into the presence of God. There was repercussions. There were things that would happen. When you read the Old Testament, the Levitical law, you find that these priests had to cleanse themselves and they had to make sure that they were ready. They had to wear certain things before they ever got in there. So there was preparation. This wasn't just like, hey, go, go downstairs and clean out this, this thing or, or hey, go light a candle. No, there, there was time that he had to go and be in there. Not only that, because at that time, you didn't become a preacher like you do today where God calls you and you go to seminary or, or a door opens for you to minister. No, you were a preacher because your dad was a preacher because you were a family of preachers and you trained in that whatever your family did. So he was a preacher's kid. Not only that, Elizabeth and her family was that same thing. She was of that line. Of, of preachers and preaching families. And so they were used to this. Here's what also you learn in that verse is they were good people. They were good people. Now, it, it doesn't say exactly how old they were. But let me say this, and I'll, I'll say it nicely here, okay? Uh, probably nicer than even what Scripture said. If Elizabeth got pregnant, it would have made other people go... That's a little weird. Okay, so in, in, inject your own age at what that is. Okay, I'm sure if you ask my kids, they're like, you know, uh, she was 38. That was way too old to have kids or whatever it may be, whatever that might be. Again, we're talking about circumstances. Now, here's a myth or something that we, that we kind of put in our own culture in our heart. Here's, here's how we view circumstances in our lives that as long as we are good people and we do what God wants us to do God will answer our prayers we absolutely have this attitude and this idea that as God will answer our prayers if we do what he wants us to do if we are good people God will answer that God punishes the bad and blesses the good the Bible is filled with that mentality and that idea, not that teaching. If you read that in the Bible, it's because people are doing it wrong and somebody comes and corrects them. But we get this myth. We also get to this idea that we have to impress God to get what we want. We have to impress God. Be really good. Pray really hard and God's going to come through. God's going to do what we almost get like this manipulation in prayer. If I pray enough, he'll eventually relent and give me what I want. But 
that's not what God does. These, they were overwhelmed by their circumstances. And so many times we became overwhelmed by our circumstances. We let our circumstances dictate and come between us and even praying to God. We let that become a connection problem for us. And they can come in a lot of different ways. Because I think as a church family over the last few years, we've seen it a lot. And we've seen families that have got reports that they didn't want. And we began to pray and the circumstances were not right. And sometimes, unfortunately, we let circumstances be the reason we don't ask for help. Because we still have in our mind, people are going to think I did something wrong. So I'm not going to tell them. I'm worried about what somebody is going to look at me. That they're going to look down on me because of my circumstances. I won't ask for help. And as the family of God, as an EBC family, that's we need to change that. I want to say it's wrong, but I don't want people to take that as a negative. I want you to tell you that we want to change that thought. If you need help, reach out. If your circumstances are not the best, reach out. Help. If you can help somebody, help them. If you don't have the means to help, reach out to the church family, call the church office, and we will. Because the truth is that some of your circumstances, because really we get to this idea of you don't understand my circumstances. You don't realize what I'm going through, and you're right. In many of your in many circumstances, I have no idea. Pastor Clint has no idea. Our deacons have no idea how to handle what you're going through. And you want to know why? Because they haven't been there. But that's why we come and we worship a God that does. Because we can't handle it. It's too big for us. And we go to a God that it is not too big. And that's why we connect with him. We allow circumstances to connect with us. Jeremiah 32, 27. As Jeremiah was looking to God. And God said, behold... I am the Lord. Is anything too hard for me? And Jeremiah realized the answer is no. We don't understand. You're absolutely right. We may not understand your circumstances, but God does. And so when you need help, we don't push you to us. We don't point you to us. We point you to the cross. When we don't understand, we go to Jesus. The next part of this is why we have a connection is rituals. Why do we have a disconnect? Because we get in our prayer life and we quit paying attention to what really is going on because we have made prayer a ritual. This was the one I circled because I am guilty of this huge. I say the same thing. I get, I get accustomed to saying the same thing in my prayers because I just say them. It doesn't mean I don't mean them, but I've gotten to a habit. I end my prayers like my dad ended his prayers when I growing up. And I get to the point where sometimes I have to take a step back and breathe and say, God, what am I really wanting to say to you? Zechariah had, had got into a custom. He was doing his priesthood duties. And an angel showed up and he got surprised. Wait, 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 wait. I'm doing this to worship God. God sends a message, and I get freaked out. What would happen on Sunday mornings if we came in and we expected God to move? There's an order of service right here and right here. There's one up there. We follow a script. We do kind of an order of service. What if God showed up on Sunday morning and we had to go off script? What if our service didn't get out around noon? Some people leave. Somebody start looking at the clock. Somebody does this. There's one or two people that start clearing their throat. <clears throat> Was it a couple of churches once, and they had a couple alarms that would go off in the congregation. Because they, but we get so ritualized in our connection and in our prayer life 
kids do the same thing. And, and it's fine. As you're a child, we teach them. We teach them prayers of rote. We teach them things that they, that, that they can understand. And eventually we want them to move on. Okay? I, I expect my five-year-old to teach her to pray, to teach her those prayers for dinner. And I'm okay with that. I don't have that same expectation with my 13-year-old as she's walking with Jesus. Can I tell you the other ritual thing? We're afraid to get mad at God and tell him. You know God's big enough for your anger. He's also big enough for your questions when you don't understand because we get so ritualized in our prayer that I pray at my meal and I pray before bed and that's one of the only times I pray. Prayer is your time to be honest with God. To take time and be like, I don't understand. I don't know what's going on, God. See, if we really want that connection, could you imagine talking to your spouse and being as ritualized in your pray, in, as your prayer life. If you said the same thing, if I just walked in and I looked at my wife and I looked at Lisa and I'd be like, I love you, you mean so much to me. And I said that every day, all the time, and that's all the only, only thing really we connected with. Or maybe I just talk, I, I don't like look her in the eye and I don't really focus on her. I just kind of talk to her in passing as I walk around the house all day. I don't really sit down and have a connection and make eye contact with her. Do marriages survive very long with that kind of connection? No, but we do it every, all the time with our walk with Jesus. We become ritualized. We talk to him like maybe once a day. It's got to be more than ritual. Number three, we find we get to the place where we just give up. We just give up. You know, there's classic movies out there, like classic movies like Ben Hur and 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 the, the original Rocky movies, you know. And then there's 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 the really really good movies like Dumb and Dumber. And there's the great line in Dumb and Dumber where 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 Lloyd meets Mary and he's at the very end, and and he's like he's like, hey, would there ever be in any way? maybe, and she's like, well, maybe, and he's like, so you're saying there's a chance. Sometimes our prayers have to be like that, that we're not willing to give up, because if there's ever a place, ever a point, are you growing tired of praying for that family member, that person that's, not, that's away from God, that person that is not following God? That person that has never given their life to Christ, and you're like, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed for years, I've prayed for decades, and they're just not coming. Here's what I can tell you. Keep praying, don't give up. There is a chance, because God is in control, and God is the one you're praying for. We see that in Luke 1 here. Zechariah and Elizabeth had given up. We're not having kids. We're not having kids. And yet, there was a chance because God was involved. They actually refused to give up because they kept praying because he kept saying, I've heard your prayers. And they got, they got a son. They got a baby. They didn't just get any baby. They got John the Baptist. They got the prophetic voice from the wilderness, Isaiah 40, verse 3. We give up in today because it didn't happen the first time. We like fast food, right? We like quick lines at, at Walmart. I don't know about you, but I have, I, I remember, okay, probably this is probably when there was a lot more checkouts open, but I remember walking and pacing, waiting for a shorter line. And I probably spent more time pacing, looking for the short line than if I would just get in one of the long lines. You know, or, or you're at the bank and you're needing to make a deposit and there's a, a, a group of people and you don't pull into one of the lanes, you wait, make sure no one's behind you, and you wait until that one person pulls off 
And then I want that one because now I'm the first one in line. Sometimes we get that way with our prayer life. We get that way with our prayer life because we want a fast response. We don't want to wait. Here's the thing, can I tell you? God's not a fast-paced God because he sees the whole story. You ever tivo or recorded a really good game or something and then it got spoiled for you on who's going to win? But then you sat down and you watched that game. And when bad things happened, bad penalties happened on your team, the other team scored, whatever it may be, you weren't worried. We worry because we view our lives, IRL, in real life, and, and it goes like this. So when bad things happen, we react. God doesn't react because he knows the final score. And we have to remember that if the person that knows what's going on, the person, have you ever watched a movie where you get, very, or, or watch that game with somebody, and maybe it's the first time, but they're just sitting back and bad things are happening and they're not really responding because they know what's about to happen? They're also the ones that hit you on the arm and go, watch this, watch this, watch this. Really good part of a movie. Hey, watch this. You got to pay attention here. This is a really good. God's like that, right? God's that person sitting back and he's not getting anxious about things. He's getting excited. The other way to get disconnected to God is we, we don't believe. We have a disbelief. And this is one of my favorite. I, I like funny Funny responses, and I'm sure if, if you wrote down hey, in, in a Bible type thing, my life and things, there's things that I do that are dumb, but we get to read the Bible and we, need to, we get to read about other dumb things that people do, okay? And this is the disbelief, uh, verse 18. Zechariah goes in, presents the God, sees, sees an angel. The angel stands up, speaks to him, gives him a prophetic word about what's going to happen. And Zechariah goes, I don't know if that's going to happen. And wait, wait, wait. I don't know about you, but if an angel appears to me in my priestly duties, in the Holy of Holies, where God's supposed to dwell, and tells me something, I think I'm going to believe it. Now, I don't, I, I, I'll tell you if it happens, if I believe it someday, I'll let you know. Maybe on the other side of glory and, and we'll be in heaven, but... But I'm thinking this is kind of a funny, this is almost as funny as when Adam and Eve hid from God like he wouldn't find them. Okay, but playing hide and go seek with the guy that made creation just doesn't seem like a fun thing. But funny Bible, how can I be sure of this? See, we pray for stuff that we really don't think God's going to come through and do. When you sit down and you begin to pray, do you really expect God to do it? It's disbelief. Exodus 3, 14. God says, I am who I am. If you were God, wouldn't you come up with a better name than I am? John 8, 58. He also refers to himself as the I am. Simply put, we, we looked at this verse on Wednesday night with our students and simply put, God is saying this, that God is, was, and always will be. Okay, I asked this question on Wednesday, and maybe I'll get some more traction, because nobody, only one person helped me out on this. Anybody remember Bret Hart? Come on, anybody, anybody remember some Bret Hart? Okay, okay, there's more in this room, good. Because Bret Hart had a catchphrase. Bret Hart was the best there is. The best there was and the best there will be. He's a wrestler in case you don't know. But here's the thing is, is God is kind of, God, he stole it from God, okay? Bret Hart stole from God this, because God, when he says, I am, he's saying, I am who is, I am who was, and I am here will be. So whatever it may be, he is. Think about what you're going to ask God in your disbelief. And God can look at you and say, I am. I am. I am your comfort. I am your peace. What you're looking for, I am. Is there anyone capable of fixing my circumstance, my problems? 
And God is sitting there and says, I am. The last thing today about your disconnection and my disconnection when it comes to our prayer life of God is this, is our disobedience. Our disobedience. Now here's the easiest way to, to put into disobedience. If you know without a shadow of a doubt that God is calling you to do something and you don't do it, you're disobedient. If you know without a shadow of a doubt that God's calling you to not do something and you do it, you're disobedient. Okay? We see that here. There are things that we have to do in our lives. God puts them in place for us to do them. Could he do them? Yes. But he allows us to do it and he utilizes us. Could God bring your friends, family, co-workers to a saving grace in Jesus Christ without you? Yes. But he chooses to use us. And he calls us in obedience to use us. If he calls you to share your faith, to share the gospel with a friend, and you say no, you're disobedient. I won't be graphic in this, but I want to be honest in this. Luke chapter 1. Okay, Zechariah gets told that he needs to, that they're going to have a baby. There is parts in his life that he had to fulfill certain husbandly duties to make this happen. If he had sat there for four months and said, well, God, she's not pregnant, he would have been disobedient. We get the same thing. If you are called to go on a mission trip and you know God's calling and you haven't went and got a passport, that's on you. That is not saying, God, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. God, where am I supposed to go? If God's calling you to missions to go around the world and tell, you're like, God, where do I go? And you don't have a passport, you haven't done what you want to do. How's this go? Mark chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus was told to throw your cloak aside. John chapter 5, a paralytic was told to pick up your mat and walk. John chapter 9, a blind man was told to take mud, put on his eyes, and go and wash. See, God calls us to do what is in our ability to do, and then he does the supernatural part of it. God's calling us to share the gospel with people. God's calling us to to share our testimonies with people. God's showing us to show Jesus in our lives and in our words and in in our lifestyles. God is calling us to do those things and it's through those things that he will work on their lives to bring them to know Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be great to have a job where your job is all marketing and if you don't make a sale one, the owner is okay with that? Think about it. Evangelism is marketing. All your job is, is to tell people how great your product is. Your product is a saving relationship in Jesus Christ. What we say is the greatest thing in our eternity. And your only job is to spread the word and make Jesus famous. You have no responsibility to sales. God says, I'll take care of that. You just spread the word. You just spread the word. See, God is telling us, hey, I want to show people at Jesus through me. God, I I want my friends to know Jesus Christ. I want my grandkids to know Jesus Christ. And yet he's telling you, okay, then live a holy life and be be an example of what a Christian should be. And we're like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I don't want to do that. And that's disobedience. And that breaks connection when we pray to God. You ever wrong somebody and avoid them? Oh, wait, 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 wait. That's too personal. Let's switch that. Has somebody ever wronged you and then avoided you? See, we always like to point the finger the other way. So it's always somebody else. It's always a friend. But you know what that's like. We all know what that's like. 
You want to know why your prayers feel like they're not leaving the room? Is because we we know there's something in our life where we're disobedient to God. We've sinned and we're wrong, and we need to get that right. Here in just a second, when the band comes up, every week we've been doing this. And I don't want anybody in this church to miss why we do this. We have a time of response every week. Now, sometimes we've got in our head that the only response you could have on a Sunday morning is to give your life to Jesus Christ. And that's one response. But the truth is, there's many responses to many messages that God's calling us to do. Sometimes it's to sharpen our sword. Sometimes it's repentance. Sometimes it's to ask forgiveness. Sometimes it's I'm going through something and my circumstances are horrible and I need somebody to pray with me because I can't do this on my own. Here in just a second, we're going to have that response and we're going to invite you. Now you can do a lot of few things. You can do that from your seat and you actually can. You can turn around, kneel before, uh, kneel down in your seat. You can come up here and kneel at the altar and say, God, I need it. You can go find somebody else in this room that you know will pray for you and lift you up and respond to God. You can stand there and sing the song with everybody else, but all of these things are responses. So when God is having a, a when we are having a disconnect with God, a disconnect of we feel like we're not connecting with God, then something's wrong. One year at, at False Creek, my last thing here. One year at False Creek, I wanted a fun theme. I wanted something different. And I think the, 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 the theme for the year was spin. And I'm like, how do we do something? And I sat down with students. I said, what spins? And we started thinking about different things that spin, a record and different things. And we got on this and we're like, you know what spins when you flush it as a toilet? How do we make a fun summer camp theme with a toilet? So we're like, how do we get, I really wanted a toilet on the t-shirt. They said no. And I'm thinking, okay, so what would stop a toilet from spinning? And it's like, hey, if you get a clog in your line and you need that plunger. So we came up with the theme of Drano. All week long, we talked about Drano. We decorated with toilet seats. One of our church members had done a, a, a remodel and gave us the old toilet. We hauled it to False Creek. We did not bring it back. And we started thinking about this. Hey, when we get a disconnect, when we get a clog in the line, how many of you guys get a clog in your toilet and just quit using that toilet and walk away? No, because that's gross and disgusting. Please don't do that. And there's times that we can fix it. There's times that we can get the plunger, we can go rent a snake, and there's times we need to call a plumber to help. If you are having a problem with your line connecting between you and God, you need to get that right. Quit coming every Sunday morning and Sunday and Wednesday, or not coming at all and staying away from the church family because there's a clog in the line and the connection's broken. Let's fix it. That's why we're here. Every Sunday morning, if you need to come down and kneel and pray after service, we have good prayer partners to come and pray for you, lay hands on you, tell you you're not alone, and reach out to God. Because he's sitting here telling you, whatever you need, whatever you need fixed, I am the solution, and I am the way to fix it. Won't you bow with me? Jesus, I just, I pray for repentance. I pray for, for forgiveness. I, I, I pray for, for connection right now, God, that we would quit dealing with these things on our own. Because day in and day out and week in and week out, we take every one of these things in our lives and we think that we're the ones that have to handle them. We have a generation and multiple generations dealing with depression, dealing with suicidal tendencies. Why? Because they think they're alone. And that's what the enemy says. And yet we come every week. And there's a generation that's learning from parents and grandparents because the parents said, you know what, I can be tough. 
I can handle this. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps and I can deal with this. And a generation that is not ready to do that has watched and they think I can do this. And the truth is we can't. None of us can. And none of us should. Because you bring us to a church family and you bring us to a savior that said you don't have to and you can't. But I can. And whether that's through our salvation, whether that's through our connection, whether it's through our prayer life, whether that's through our circumstances, we would come to you on bended knees and we would focus on the cross and we would focus on Jesus. And as we're focused on the cross, we're going to look around and we're going to find that there's church family members, there's friends all around us with their arms around us saying, you're not alone. You're not alone. Quit trying to carry this by yourself. I may not understand what you're going through, but you're not by yourself. And if they don't know you as Lord and Savior, if they don't know what that is, they would know that they're not alone and that they could come. And we would love the opportunity to share about a Savior who said, you're right, you can't do it on your own, but I can do it for you if you'll just surrender to me. pray, Father. Amen. Would you stand with me? Like I said, there's lots of ways to respond today. If you need to come and kneel and pray, if you need to find somebody in the room to pray with you, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you want that opportunity, come talk to me. I'd love to tell you about Jesus. that we can confess that together this morning. I want to invite our prayer partners to come forward as we dismiss. Um, here in just a minute when we dismiss, they'll be up front. And the reason we do that is so that there's no time limit. As Roger was saying, whatever you need from them, prayer, 
and whatever struggle you want to bring to them and, and have prayer over, there's no time limit. So they'll be up here as we dismiss. You can come talk to them and they'll hang out for a minute or two. Um, or else seek a trusted friend around you. That'd be great too. Either way, I want to encourage us as we leave to be the hands and feet of Christ. I hope God spoke to you in a way you needed, but I also want you to think who in your life needs to know about the connection they can have with God. Who in your life needs to know about the closeness they can feel with God again? And how, can, how might God want to use you this week to tell them? So, Lord, be with us, your people, as we go out. Lord, you've called us not to be um, confined to a huddle on Sunday mornings and, and no more. You've called us to be hands and feet, God, and mouthpiece of good news to the world around us. So, Lord, as we go out, I pray that that is what can be said of us. And may your spirit be moving. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you here back tonight.